everyone. Great to see you again today for our next episode. So I'm um, excited today to go a bit further on the topic of making the implicit explicit, which I guess is something that we're quite nerdy about in Greater Than. And um, following on from the other episode where we talked about this on, I guess, a little bit more general terms and more conceptually, today we wanted to get much more into the nitty gritty that we are very nerdy about, which is everything around handbooks, agreements, guides, tutorials, toolkits, all of those things. Um, anything really that helps us uh, like write down or capture in a super tangible way the implicit that we've made explicit. And there's definitely uh, a lot to this topic, I must say. Um, it maybe seems sort of simple at first, but it's a, it can be a pretty big uh, well with lots of interesting things to unpack. So I'm quite excited today for us to, yeah, I guess, get a bit more clear on what do we, what do we see uh, the role of these different types of artifacts, we often call them, to make the implicit explicit, and how do they support organizations in operating in a, in a healthy and smooth way. And yeah, what are some of our favorite examples of how this actually works and some of the things that we've learned in really trying to apply this and get started? Because I think this is something that a lot of people ask us about when we uh, do our work, because Greater Than has a bunch of this stuff out there that's open source and public. So people sometimes see our handbook and say, hey, how do, how do you do that? How do, I, how do I make my own handbook? So that's a bit also where the idea for this episode came from, to look a little bit more behind the scenes of this topic. So I think to get into it, it would be really interesting for us to just get more clear on the why. So why do we actually need things like handbooks, agreements, guides, and the like in the types of organizations that we're working in, in communities and networks and self-organized systems? And what is sort of their equivalent or what place or gap are they filling that, uh, that is created when we sort of leave behind other types of organizing? So yeah, maybe Susan, you wanna kick us off a bit to help us understand why this is so important. I think there's many reasons and, and, you know, carrying on from the making the uh, implicit explicit theme that in a traditional organization or many of the organizations that I kind of cut my teeth in before I um, left those types of organizations is that the handbook really was more about compliance and the things that you can't do. Um, more than how we do the things that we're encouraging or expecting people to do. So I think that that's, that's one of them. I think in thinking about what does a handbook uh, allow or enable, um, as opposed to how you'd interact with things, again, like agreements and guides in a traditional organization is, you know, I was thinking about this, like, I just asked my boss, right? you just ask the boss what to do, or you just like go to HR and ask them what to do. And it was almost like the information was siloed in these um, various contexts around, you know, compliance based in the organization. And what handbooks really allow, especially if the handbooks are public, is it's almost a way of thinking and working out loud and describing out loud um, what the organization is and how it operates and what it does. And the the beauty and the opportunity that's created by that is that it 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 makes the information accessible, transparent, and it really gives everybody in the organization a chance to both uh, interact with the how, regularly and consistently and again the, my favorite thing about handbooks especially handbooks in the in the in the sphere of what we're talking about is that they're public right and it's a way for these artifacts this thinking this description of the i guess the the 
not necessarily the organizing principles, but like the foundations of how we do things at our various companies is out there to inspire everybody. And I think that's quite different than the compliance based, you know, handbook that you'd get, you know, maybe you'd get like a physical copy that you'd put in your drawer when you started a job. This is way different, way different from this. And I'm curious, Lisa, about how you've experienced that in the past. Well, I have to say, you know, when I worked in traditional organizations, I can't remember a time that I actually read the handbook that I was given. <laughs> I remember like, like here are the things I'm not supposed to do and they're written down and I'm, I'm, yeah. and I'm sure I'm, not, I'm such a good little student wanting the gold star. I'm sure I actually did look at it, but then it was gone because it wasn't relevant, you know, and, and the things that were more relevant to me, which is like, who gets to make this decision? Those were things that are completely not in that kind of handbook in a traditional organization. And also when I go to my boss, Susan, as you said, like that's another source of information about how to do something, I go to my boss. If I went to my boss, they likely would not have known how we make this decision. So we were sort of left to our own devices on some really important things. And then some things that were the outliers, the things that sort of cause legal problems for organizations were described ad nauseum in the handbook. So it was, um, it, it was performative is what I would say. And it was for the organization more than for uh, the, the people who are in the organization. But I've also had this situation recently with organizations that aren't traditional, that are coming from an egalitarian, collaborative, more flat organization kind of um, buy or value system. And I think it's just a, an allergy really to those kind of traditional handbooks we were just talking about where they, they want to document nothing. They want to have nothing written down. And so as a result, it's kind of the, the idea of like, yeah, you know, everyone is empowered. You can do whatever you want, but, but then everyone's kind of like, I don't know, can I do that? Can I do that? Like, How do we do this? And so there's a little bit of a, a sort of a stop and go energy in the organization and a lot of, um, over time, a lot of frustration. And I think mm -hmm. that and then people start focusing on personalities and other issues that are going on rather than looking at the fact that some minimal uh, artifact, some minimal communication about how we do things actually could be useful, even if it's to say, we don't have a defined decision-making process. Like, even if you would say that to people, they would be like, oh, okay, so we don't have that defined. That means I have some latitude here, you know? So it's just, it's interesting I think sort of the backlash that's happened in some organizations where they've gone a little bit too far and they're like, oh, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to pin anyone down. We don't want to define anything too much. Yeah, I think that's, that's really uh, well said because I think that describes exactly this gap that we're trying to fill with handbooks, agreements, et cetera. When you go from the system where ask your boss and they'll tell you what to do or they'll tell you, I don't know, and you need to figure it out or... Uh, we're basically in a in a system where we don't have that anymore. And then I think, as you described, a lot of groups sort of end up in this tyranny of structurelessness, as we also call it. And then having like informal power dynamics and things not being clear. And I think then it's very, very risky, right? The individuals end up holding a lot of power through knowledge. And I think uh, it seems essential to be true to our values, let's say, in terms of organizing differently, that you actually put the effort into making things accessible, writing them down so anyone can participate. It's like, it seems like a foundation for participation to be possible. Hmm. Absolutely. And I love what you said, because it, it made me think about um, something that we've discussed here before is like, when is it time? When is it ready? When is it ripe? When do we know that we have maybe not necessarily an agreement, but like a guide of how specifically to do something. And I love what you said, Lisa, about even having placeholders, like thinking about a handbook as you're starting, as you're thinking about how to, again, make the explicit, the implicit explicit in this, in this way of writing it down and working out loud is even having placeholders. We don't quite know how to do this yet, but we, it's there because as it emerges, we know we we can go back there and 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 refresh it, fill it in, update it, and that's the other thing that I love about handbooks, as opposed to like this um, this uh, you know physical artifact, is that they are mutable and you can change them anytime. Yeah, so that that maybe brings us quite well into just briefly 
uh, summarizing what we mean when we say handbook or agreement or guide, because you were just uh, pointing towards a really key element, Susan, when it comes to handbooks, which is them being alive, right? So something that is like a living document that evolves over time as the organization evolves. And so that definitely is a, is a very big departure from what traditional handbooks often are. Um, not something that you just receive once and then never look at again. But that, yeah, when we talk about handbooks, we really mean something that sort of reflects the most recent state of how the organization is working that we feel is uh, worth making explicit. And I think we're going to talk about that a bit later also today in terms of when is that moment? Like, when do I update it? <laughs> right? When is something ready to go in there? But um, it's basically, yeah, the whatever the consent is on currently the best way that we can make this explicit of how something works. That's what's in the handbook. And I think that like, you know, a handbook is usually some sort of more global document hub. You know, sometimes it's more in the form of like a wiki or people use things like GitHub or Gitbook or Notion. Those are some of the tools that get used to, to publish handbooks. It can also just be a Google Doc. But I think um, the idea with the handbook is that it sort of is a bit of a knowledge hub. It, it connects lots of different pieces and covers sort of all the key areas of an organization. And so it's quite holistic in its like more developed, mature version, let's say. But I don't know, like anything to add on that from either of you or otherwise, maybe you could share how you would describe what an agreement is in relationship to that. Well, I'm looking forward to learning since I am new to greater than re reasonably new as an associate. And I've been using our handbook quite frequently, but I had never really paid attention to the fact that it was divided into a handbook agreement and guide. And so I don't really know the difference between them. And so you know, teach on ladies, <laughs> me and everyone else. <laughs> yes. Susan, do you want to pick it up? Yeah. I mean, so the, 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 for me, the uh, expression of an agreement is uh, the actually writing down of um, a, a process of how we have decided to do something. And generally speaking, um, at least in greater than, or um, also in Inspiral, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is uh, an agreement is a, um, is a clear explanation of how decisions are made, right? So for example, uh, in, in, in our realm, when we're thinking about making agreements, we generally use Lumio to do that. And I think that at some point we'll have a, have another episode talking about tools like Lumio and why, and when we choose to use those to, uh, align on a, uh, a process or a practice. Basically one key area of agreements is usually how decisions are made. But there's also things like um, we have the people agreement, we call it, which we totally uh, took from Inspiral, which is describes what are the different sort of roles or levels of engagement that exist in the system. Or also like a financial agreement, which is more specifically around like decisions on finances, but also uh, how how money flows. And I think like I find it quite helpful to sort of understand what an agreement is in comparison to a guide, or at least that's what I'm often thinking about when I'm like doing my work, which is like, is this an agreement that I'm working on or is this just a guide? <laughs> which is basically that an agreement always has a decision-making process underpinning it that happened. So as Susan was saying on a tool like Lumio, for instance, like it's sort of like the constitution. Mm -hmm. It's something that is a bit more formal you don't update it very often. Like the idea is really that an agreement shouldn't be changing too much. It's usually quite stable and that it's something that you usually take time to change that many people give feedback on because it's sort of like fundamental pillars about how we operate. And so when something is a guide, it's more like information. It's, you know, some suggestions of how to do something. Like, for instance, we have a guide on how to use our, key, our CRM, right? 
And like, it's just a guide here. This is sort of how we structured it, but it's not like, oh, we're going to do a big consent process on, you know, create an agreement for this is how you must use the CRM. Like that would be way too sort of um, too heavy for something like that. So yeah, I think that's something that helps me sometimes in, in differentiating. But yeah, does that feel, do you feel like Lisa, that sort of um, helps you clarify? And th those both sit within a handbook, right? So the handbook is the, the, the holding place. And then you can add, I mean, I would say one can be as creative as one wants in terms of what else goes in a handbook, depending on the organization, what they might want to put there, like what is actually important. Because like in greater than we have the list of all the current associates and partners, for instance, because I think it's useful to have like a clear list that's public that people know, ah, these are the, these are the humans that are in it. But in many communities, for instance, it wouldn't make any sense to have that because they're way too dynamic. So yeah, I think um, it's really up to each org to decide what goes inside that handbook. But agreements and guides are two pretty key elements that one would often find. Yeah, just refreshing myself again in the in Spiral handbook is that in Spiral has, I think, about uh, 10 or 15 agreements. And I think that the reason for this is in a, more of a community context where uh, it's not it's not like greater than is, which is, you know, a, 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 coll a collective, a livelihood vehicle, um, more being more explicit about things like uh, personal conduct or diversity or how to use the brand or what the board's about is, uh, I think, more important to describe in terms of uh, this is this. These are our decisions about this. This is, you know, this this the current like friends of the st the current state of what is important to us and what we've made decisions about. So I think that maybe agreements it is more aligned, as you said, Fran, with the things that the collective has made a decision about mm -hmm. and agreed upon. Yeah, from, from my part, the distinction between them is really clear. And I appreciate the fact that there are three agreements in greater than, because when I, because I use the handbook all the time, oh, and probably every two weeks, I'm looking up something in the handbook. And, um, and the fact that the that the agreements are very minimal but complete, like there's not a lot of them, but I can find what I need, and I don't typically have a lot of questions after I read an agreement. I'm like, oh, okay, so that's how that's how we do it. Okay, that's cool. And then the guides are super helpful, like how to invoice. That's a pretty important thing, like the first time you have to do that. And um, you know, and I'm really breaking myself of the habit of finding the knowledge holder. So like, I didn't realize that I had created in myself sort of a superpower of figuring out who the knowledge holders are in organizations so that I can go sort of in a hub and spoke way when I have a question like how to invoice and go to that person and get the information I need. Because in our other organizations where it's not public, it's not written down, you know, you really have to be quite good at ferreting out who has the information. You know, and, and it's a habit that I still have that that you all are very kindly breaking me up. <laughs> like, yeah, that's in the handbook. Or, you know, why don't you ask in the open Slack group, you know? So, I mean, just having these, not only the handbook, but then also the human beings that can that can answer questions when they come up um, in, a, in a collective. It's just, it, that's new to me. And it's really cool. Yeah, and I think also, as you were saying, Susan, like the handbook, handbooks being something public, and sometimes even the detail with which, like, you know, some of the things of how we operate are out there. For most people, that might not be interesting, but it is quite interesting when it comes to, like, recruitment, which we're also going to do another episode on, but that it gives people the real insight of, like, how, how does this work, this place, and do I want to be part of it? So it really helps people in that self-onboarding process basically, or self-filtration of like, is this the kind of place that I want to work in and be part of? And I do think that that's quite useful in terms of signaling. And we don't have to do anything, right? Like we're creating that anyway for ourselves. And just by putting it out there, we get that, that extra benefit.
So yeah, I think um, one other thing I just wanted to um, touch on in terms of the number of agreements, because you were mentioning that, Lisa, is that I think it's really important with handbooks and any of these kind of uh, documentations to really stay with the, the most minimum viable of what's really needed and to regularly review and like clean up. Because I do think actually in the case of Inspiral, there's been a bit of an accumulation of agreements and it's a bit much. And I remember when, when we started the Greater Than Handbook, I specifically was like, okay, I wanna try to figure out what are the most important ones that we need. And I'm sure over time we will add more and communities have different needs than, than a, you know, a business collective. But yeah, I think uh, it's quite easy for these things to, to become sort of like dump piles where lots and lots of stuff accumulates and you sort of need to do a spring clean every year to make sure that it stays sort of relevant and tight. Yeah, I think the other piece to that is if you find out that people are not going to it for answers, then that's a clue that something needs to change, you know, because it really should be something quite alive and, um, you know, immediately useful. Yeah, I agree with that. Like immediately useful, not having to dig too far to find what you need. And like Fran said, minimum viable, but very clear what's where and how to use what. I was thinking about um, like the idea of updating. And like you said, Fran, the Inspiral um, handbook has, they're, they're, it's very useful and it's probably like the seed handbook for many other handbooks out there in the world. Uh, but they, the, the frustration with um, having it be the artifact where everything goes, um, I think has made it quite overwhelming. And then it makes that spring cleaning really difficult. Like if I think about how to do that, you know, is it a role in the organization that somebody every quarter goes and kind of combs through the handbook to see if anything's out of date, if anything needs to be changed? Is it something that everybody is expected to do? Like even making things like that explicit. If I think I was thinking when you were talking about wikis, I remember a couple of years ago with the Reinventing Organizations wiki, it was it had become both out of date and there was much more um, information and examples to be put in. And so we had to gather like, I don't know, 15 people from all around the world and have a sprint on um, cleaning up and updating the wiki or handbook. So that's another way that you can go about ensuring that it's kept um, fresh and up to date. I think the other thing about the Inspiral handbook and you touched on this as well, Fran, is that um, it was it, it's in Git. And so that takes a level of like technical expertise in terms of um, approving pull requests, et cetera, which does then um, limit uh, the number of humans that, that either feel like they are technically capable of doing that or wanting to learn something else so that that can happen. And then, of course, there has to be people on the back end to approve and, and understand, you know, why that technology um, was the best at the time. Um, but you, tools um, that are proliferating now, like Notion, make make it very much easier for um, anybody in the in the system and collective to do that. But yeah, I'm just curious about the question of does do changes to the handbook need to be approved, and what does that look like, and how do we make sure again that it doesn't become a dumping ground and it doesn't just become a place where anybody can express an opinion about how mm -hmm. to do something. Yeah. And I think the only part that I feel clear on there is that like changes to agreements have to be decided together collectively by the decision making process for agreements. But everything else. Yeah, I mean, not really, um, because otherwise, it's hard to keep things useful and fresh. But yeah. I get Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Well, I'm just imagining in, in terms of the useful and fresh, I'm imagining the role of someone who comes in once a quarter and does spring cleaning. And the what that can do in a system is kick up a bunch of conversations that are not important right now. You know, like we're, we're going to take people out of the context of what they're working on and put them in a context that's not fresh for them right now. Like, so now, so now we're going to spin up some work on, you know, this on freshening up this agreement. But it's not it's not evolving or it's not um, 
coming up, getting generated from the work itself, from an actual live example. That's what I find so useful, I think, about these handbooks is that they're coming from live examples. They're not coming from, you know, some smart process engineer sitting down trying to figure out the best way to do something. Um, and I don't know. So I, I just wonder about the balance of like how much spring cleaning do we need if it kicks up these unnecessary cycles of work that people are not, their minds are not in that context anyway. And how much mess can we tolerate? And I don't know. I, I imagine that's different for every organization, right? Yeah. And I think to be honest, like I'm a big believer of any type of tool or artifact usually being sort of a reflection of the current state of the organization. And so that if something is not being updated when actually it's changing, it's sort of a symptom of some other issue, right? Mm -hmm. And that there's maybe something else missing in terms of that link being made. And so, I mean, that brings me to what I think is a question that would be good to just talk a little bit more about, which, which is this question of, how do I know when it's the right moment to make something explicit in a handbook, in an agreement, when it's time to update it? When is it like already, like what are maybe telltale signs of like, it's too late? I mean, too late is, you know, better than, than never. But uh, yeah, like any, any examples or anecdotes on how, how, does, how does sort of that process of, I'm now gonna put something in the handbook or propose an agreement, how does that happen like in practice when we're in the work itself? I mean, I think the, the easiest example of that is uh, either when I have a bunch of questions that I, I, I need answered and I'm, I'm doing that pattern that Lisa was describing is going to the context holder and saying, oh, I don't get this. Um, and I think this is especially true um, like on financial stuff or maybe even on like externally facing uh, website stuff. It's like, and I know Fran that you bear the brunt of a lot of that sometimes because that's um, that those are roles that you frequently take. And I think that uh, the question is maybe best directed at you. Like, what is, what is your sign? Like how many times do you need to be asked before you think, oh gosh, okay. Right now is the time to get this out of my head and into the handbook. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, it's sort of about the the frequency and the similarity of the questions. Yeah. That like, if someone asks the questions and it's like, oh, well, actually it depends. We're still figuring that out. We've tried this, we've tried that. We're definitely not at agreement stage, right? If that's yeah. the answer. Um, and the, I think there's something about yeah, usually it's from questions that people ask or maybe struggles in the system that emerge because there's a lack of clarity. Like, let's say people aren't joining projects, aren't joining new projects. And it's like, they don't know what projects are happening or they don't know how to get involved. They don't know what to do. Like, probably that means that there's some sense making needed to understand better like what is actually holding them back and maybe it could be at the like far end of that you realize our levels of engagement aren't clear what are the different ways of being in the system and that's the kind of thing will that will then lead you to at some point creating an agreement to say look there's this and this and this role and you can choose one of them and that will help you navigate so i think there's definitely a quite important role of the sort of observing the system, seeing where things are like maybe stuck, like where are they not flowing? Where are people missing important information that is maybe obvious to the, especially the people in the middle, right? Because that's where you you get really blind. You, you're just assuming like, oh, of course, we all know that this is how things work. <laughs> so the things that are obvious to that group, but aren't to others. Usually when you when you try to sort of look into that gap, that's where you can find stuff that's usually ripe to start writing down. Mm. The other thing that was coming up for me when you were sharing that, um, Fran, is uh, when when something is uh, not maybe permanently or perpetually conjoined to a role, that being able to share that process, practice, guide um, makes it easier and more obvious that this is a dis 
distributed role or a role that doesn't necessarily um, need to be persistent or perpetual sitting with one person that I'm not, I'm not sure if that exactly makes sense, but I feel like that's also um, a sign or a signal that um, something should be articulated in the handbook or in a guide. Mm. I think I've seen another signal in Grid the Greater Than system recently, which is when someone proposes something and then key players realize they have a conflict about it and they didn't mm. know. That's a they good didn't point. know that they had this difference of opinion. They didn't know yeah. that it, the, pers the, the perspectives were not aligned. And it might, you know, go into a big conflict resolution process before, before it comes out the other end and maybe becomes a guide or an agreement, depending on how important it is. But I really, I, you know, I know that we had a moment of that recently in Greater Than, and I so appreciated the people involved in that. Do you two were two of them? So appreciate the people involved in that to just, you know, create a bookmark for the entire organization. Okay, we've now just found a place where there's a really strong difference of opinion. We're going to take some time to process it and we will let you know what happens. And I thought that was amazing. And what it and what it resulted in for me was a couple of things. One is that I had confidence that the things that are in the handbook are for real. Um, and so I, it gave me a little more trust in it. Um, and the other thing is that, um, is that it, was, it was just a beautiful example of a really kind of facilitative um, leaderfulness, you know, from the people in the organization to, to not do that behind closed doors in a way that no one knew what was happening. And then all of a sudden there's some agreement or guide or something that comes out of left field and then everyone's wondering why did that what the hell happened <laughs> where, where did that come from you know so I was I just really appreciated how it was a uh, walking the talk and a live example hmm. yeah that's really interesting thanks for sharing that Lisa and yeah that I, I think that that um Again, this goes back to this idea of as things are coming up, um, creating placeholders, or it, even if we're not creating the placeholders in the handbook itself, but um, marking and indicating this is something that's on our mind at the minute, and we are we are working through it. I think is super interesting, and maybe I don't know. Maybe that becomes a I know it's maybe not fully minimum viable, but. Fran, just thinking maybe a different section in the handbook of um, elements of this handbook that we're thinking about that aren't ripe yet um, could also be um, something into something Definitely. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that sort of reminds me of one of the most important, I guess, pieces of advice usually that I give people when starting a handbook, because I think often they might look at handbooks that they see out there that are like quite complete or let's say matured because they're never complete. And think like, oh my God, I need all these things. But the, the way every handbook starts is like with the first page. And it's like, start writing down the things that you already know. And as you were saying, Lisa, uh, the things that you don't know, just make explicit that they're not defined yet, right? And I think that like, in many cases, it can be extremely useful to say, oh, we don't have a conflict resolution process currently. We've just been going ad hoc or, you know, just one sentence blurb to, to sort of make explicit where something is currently at or that it's information or discussion can be extremely useful. So yeah, I, I think, think it does. I think what that does is free up people's energy. Yeah. Because basically I think, I don't, I don't know if maybe I'm unique in this, probably not, is that when I don't know, I just slow down and sort of maybe even get stopped and then just find something else to get busy with. You know, so there's so many things to just distract myself with if I feel like I, I don't know what to do next. And a lot of that happens quite subconsciously, you know? So I think that a lot of people are stopped on a lot of things subconsciously and then just keep themselves busy doing other stuff. And that's mm -hmm. just, a, what a waste, what a waste of people's energy and potential. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't know why, well, maybe I do know why, like I'm getting very uh, interested in and hyped up about, about the handbook, even in this conversation. It's like, how far do we go? Like, oh, like, 
did, how how much do we want to talk about or think about agreements of um you know we're we're very good about doing and talking about our internal money work and our internal money stories like how would we dare maybe to start to share some of our um inner workings about money on our handbook um I don't know I don't know how people feel about that I mean we've got a a really amazing um, way of looking at that internally. Uh, how how can you know? Is the handbook the way to actually push that a little bit further out to give people even a little bit more encouragement, or even ourselves about oh, so what would it look like if we were actually sharing a little bit more pub publicly? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that's just the little in me that's like oh let's see what happens or if it's actually uh could be uh, very useful and and you know create the conditions for even uh more inspiration about what a um what a collective that is intent on uh documenting our own creation can do and should do well it's interesting that you mentioned the example of the money work stuff susan because um we have published a guide it's just not on the handbook, right? It's actually on our website, like in our in our toolkit section on, on the happy money story practice and how we run it. And actually, to me, that's an interesting example because I mean, I wrote that case study because there was this uh, larger initiative that was not greater than to write things about this kind of work. And it was sort of the first attempt to try to write down a bit more our process so it's definitely something that we can use internally to see like, ah, yes, how does our happy money story work? But uh, it has gotten quite a lot of attention and it did confirm a little bit this hesitation that I had about it because specifically this is, you know, probably a whole nother set of episodes, but when it comes to money work, it's super, super sensitive. And like, you can open up so much stuff and like, you have to be very careful uh, when you do that. And that people just read the case study and they're like, cool, here's the guide, here are the steps, I'm just going to do it. And that they don't have all the context that they need to do it safely, let's say. And so, um, yeah, that is something where like uh, I've, I've heard one or two stories of people that have, have seen, seen that guide uh, sort of run with it. And uh, yeah, I guess it's, it's always an interesting question when it comes to this open sourcing of how do you make sure to do it in a way that's also responsible for the people that then pick it up. But so I guess. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah, this is the really nice little edge that we're on. And Susan, you are an edge pusher for sure. And um, yeah, there's something about money you're really brewing. And um, yeah, another question about responsibility and um, on the other side, um, accessibility. Like just more people that hear about how you can look back and divvy up the money you got for something in a way that makes everyone happy is a really interesting thing. Most people have never experienced anything like that. So yeah, I think before we um, close on this topic, because obviously we're discovering many more subtopics that we can dive into here, um, I thought it could be nice to just do a quick sort of lightning round of what is one of our favorite handbooks and why to just uh, get a bit of a short list and then maybe uh, share any other practical tips we might have for people getting started and then and then wrap it up for this episode. So yeah, maybe Susan, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the Inspiral Handbook is the one that I, aside from the Greater Than Handbook, the one that I use most frequently, especially when I'm working with clients um, on their handbooks. It's like, oh, uh, okay, that's a good question. How does the Inspiral Handbook represent that? What, what, how, what does that look like in the Inspiral Handbook? So for me, it's just become the um, kind of reference guide. Um, because like we said before, it has a lot of stuff. It's become kind of a dumping ground, but um, I'm, I'm always pretty sure that anything that has to do with handbooks that I'd like an example on or a refresher on, I can go to the Inspiral Handbook and find it. Yeah, yeah. and I would add that most, most handbooks I've made, I use the Inspiral um, grid as a starting point. So like mm -hmm. so much acknowledgement and gratitude to the people that started it because yeah, it's really uh, proven its value in being open source. Yeah. 
I think mine is my favorite one. I wouldn't say it's a handbook. It's called the CRISP DNA. And it's really just like a sort of a random list of how the organization works. And I love it because so many of the things in it are metaphor driven. So like the way that they handle um, requests coming in for work, which is like a typical business development thing, they call it the bun protocol because they want to like a hot bun, like a hot cinnamon bun is great on day one. Okay on day two, pretty bad on day three and four. And if you got to put the thing in the microwave to heat it back up, it's really, really not very good. And so that's their idea of like, if we get a bun, we want to do something with it or move it to someone who can do something with it within two or three days at the most. And it just, I think it creates a lot of ease in understanding what the, um, what the agree agreements or guides are because metaphors hold a lot more complexity than a list of behavioral agreements or process. Yeah, and I think uh, one that I wanted to share was the Genie Handbook, which is a, a handbook from a software development company based in Munich. And um, not so much in terms of the, the form because there's this like, it's a PDF that you can get to through their website. But what I think is really interesting about some of the sections they have in there are a really good example of how they make something implicit explicit, which is around what they call sort of the, the genie way and the genie role, which is basically the expectations that there are when you join the organization. Because they're a regular company, they have employees, right? But basically, if you decide to become an employee, included in the expectations of your job is also to contribute to developing the organization and like developing the culture and holding that space. And it's something that comes up a lot in the, the orgs that we work with that people somehow have a hard time understanding. They think it's sort of on top or something like a bonus that you might contribute to that. And they've just found a really good way in their handbook to make that super crystal clear. Like if you decide to join this organization, you are buying into this. And these are the things that, that are really, yeah, encouraged and expected. So I think that really helps create a lot of clarity of like, what type of organization are we? And also, is this a right fit for you or not? So um, we'll make sure to link to all of these in the show notes if you want to check them out. So the uh, Inspiral Handbook, the Crisp DNA, and the Genie Handbook. And so and, maybe and the just greater than handbook. Let's make sure course. we have a link to the greater than handbook, the one yes. I use every other week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll link to that one too. Um, and I just thought to close us off, if if there's any yeah key advice, tips, challenges that we want to share for people that are getting started with this, and uh, yeah, might need some support or things to look out for to not fall into as they, they work on this. Should we do another lightning round? Yeah, I would say just get started and be mindful about what tech you use. And kind of maybe one of the first decisions that you can make as you're getting into it is, 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 the, is the who and the how um, to ensure that um, whatever that uh, motivation is can be easily um, enacted. Yeah. And I think mine is a, is a warning about not falling into the pitfall of what we see in traditional handbooks. Um, and so when you're thinking about what to put in the handbook, um, think about, you know, the question, does this actually help the people doing the work, do the work, you know, other things can go other, other places, but probably not in the handbook. Hmm. Yeah. And that also means like not being too literal Right. So sort of going the, the, the route of principles or to you not to confuse. Of course, it's, it's got guiding, guiding elements. Right. It's not exactly a guide, but something that leaves room for interpretation, because, yeah, you don't want to have just like something that's like a huge list of rules that you need to follow or almost like laws. And I think the, the only other one I would add, which we have talked about quite a bit, but is really trying to find that balance between how much to update and how much to let it rest um, because it just can be very exhausting if you're trying to reflect every little miniature detail. And that actually goes again into this question of, you know, not being too prescriptive. So the better you are at articulating more general principles and sort of trusting that the people reading it are going to be able to understand, oh, this is sort of the intention of what 
we're supposed to do. And now I can figure out how do I apply it. The more you do that, the less often you're also going to have to update it when one little thing changes. So I think, yeah, having having a conversation before you start a handbook about what does it mean for us to have a living document? What does it actually need to look like? And yeah, what are the what are the right tools that will also help it really be useful for people? I think that's really important. Mm. When you were sharing that what came to mind was, um, I think we're all old enough to remember the Lonely Planet guides. Remember like, like, you know, a destination, it gives you everything that you need to orient yourself to a place. Um, but it, at some point, two, three years down the line, things change and it's out of date and how, and some of the core principles might remain, but how, how do we take an inspiration like that as sort of like that guidebook, um, and, and ensure that we're kind of really judicious about what needs to be updated regularly and what kind of just stays as the flavor and the essence of, of the handbook itself. Yeah, awesome. I think that's probably a, a, lot of, a lot of tips to get people started. And so hopefully after hearing this, you maybe feel a little bit more uh, energized or encouraged to start your own if you haven't yet. And yeah, it uh, was great to have this conversation and looking forward to more coming soon. Thanks, Susan and Lisa. Thanks, and everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.